this episode of Dolce Vita, redefine the yakiniku culture with the finest wagyu beef. Explore the fun and challenges behind pottery making. Talk about life and art with the co-founder and creative director of a luxury jewelry brand. And check out ways to stay healthy with an expert. Things are more relaxed. Well, of course, Japan. Not only is it close, whether it's the scenery, the fashion, the gastronomy, it never fails to surprise me. Plus, didn't you know, my favorite cuisine has always been Japanese. <laughs> now, great minds think alike. Now, the thing I miss the most about Japan is always going to be their Wagyu beef. What makes it special is, first of all, the, most of the brand name uh, Wagyu is normally it's the name of the city or the area of the places in Japan. But uh, Ozaki beef is uh, one single farmer makes it. The uh, name of the farmer is Ozaki. That's why it's called Ozaki beef, right? It's, um, that means very consistent in a very high level. And how he produces it is, uh, or he picked the best quality uh, Wagyu uh, baby cow that fits to his way of uh, raising and he feeds the natural feeds and then uh, the cow lives longer than usual uh, Wagyu's. Our omakase menu she includes six uh, red different cuts of uh, Wagyu from leaner to the fattier, the richest. I think normally the image everyone has is uh, very fatty because it comes from the marble. Uh, yes it is from like strip loin, ribeye, or those tenderloin, those uh, premium, premium cuts. Also, some other part includes the fat, but the, the quality of meat cuts of beef, mm -hmm. I think there's one thing that you must try, and that's this garlic wagyu fried rice here. Oh, that looks nice. I'm going to dig in. You better save room for dessert. I heard the chef has got a lot of surprises for us today. I love handmade products, DIY, anything to do with crafts because I think that making something with your own hands is so unique and you get to gift it to somebody after. It's also a fun and creative way to pass the time. Now I think that I've tried a lot of different crafts but I haven't really tried pottery making. I'm really looking forward to learning more about it. A ceramic artist once said, pottery making is an endless loop because clay is reusable and transformable before the firing process. Therefore, people should focus more on the handcrafted experience rather than just the final products. Hi Amber, why is pottery making getting more popular recently? We live in a very stressful city mm -hmm. and uh, people are always looking for ways to de-stress themselves. So what's the most important element of pottery making? I think if I have to pin down one of the most important elements, it's patience mm -hmm. because it takes time. You can't rush it through. If you rush it through, things doesn't get done properly mm -hmm. and then it might crack. And I think in pottery making, it's always a 50-50 chance anyway. For the each steps, it's very crucial because it affects the next one. Now, I know a lot of people probably, when they think of pottery, they think of pottery throwing. Mm -hmm. But there's also something I heard called hand-building pottery. Yeah. Now, what's the difference there? Well, there are many ways of making ceramics. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you wanted to achieve mm -hmm. in order to apply the techniques that it's in order to achieve the final outcome you want. Throwing, it's a bit like some of the famous scenes that you see in movies and it needs a machine that is spinning, self-centered spinning, and everything that you make, for example, like a bowl or plate or a cup, everything is round shape. Right. So it's quick and easy. And if you want to make something that is in productions identical, then using the wheel would be perfect. Um, hand building, if you wanted to achieve something, for example, like a sculpture or uh, things that it's not just round shapes, mm -hmm. then you will need to apply hand building techniques in order to make for example, like uh, human figures, or it could be anything that is irregular shapes. Now, I see a lot of people think that, you know, pottery is just, you know, putting objects together with clay, but there's also methods for coloring them, isn't there? Yeah. Can you tell me more about that? So the technical term for coloring in ceramics is called glazing. Mm. And there are many different ways of glazing and glazes around the world. Um, some people prefer painting, so that we call underglazes. 
um, and some people prefer dipping or spraying and that usually with overglazes. Mm. So it depends on the outcomes that you wanted to achieve in order to apply which type of glazes you wanted to use. Oh, yeah, I see. I heard there's also something called luster or gold luster. Mm -hmm. How's that different from glaze? So gold luster is made from pure gold mm. and uh, if you wanted to highlight something, for example, you've made a piece and it's got a little animal on the top and then you wanted to that, you know, to have the spotlight, then we would apply gold luster, silver luster. Uh, there are many different types of lusters made from natural material and you fire it up to a certain degree and it comes out shiny like gold. Now, how do you think pottery making benefits like kids or just anyone who wants to try pottery making? I don't think there is a limit um, in terms of age or background or what kind of um, you know things you're into in um, pottery making because it's, it's a bit like building sandcastles when you were kids right. you know you, you, you use a material in order to build something that's 3D and you need the imaginations in your head so it's using clay clay is just a, a lump of things and then you need to sculpt it and then also you need to think you need to evaluate um, in order to see if the making or the method that you are using is correct or not. For kids, um, it trains their patience and also it trains them to help them understand that even though you've done each step correctly, the outcome doesn't always come out as the way you want it. Because it can crack, we're not, you know, during firing, we're not in the kiln to see it. Um, so you don't really know what the results will be like until the moment you open the kiln. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, a, that's definitely a learning process for kids because it's, it's the same as it reflects like lives. You know, it takes you to the unexpected turns and then you just have to deal with it, pick yourself up. If, if it breaks, pick yourself up again and do it all over again. Now, in your opinion, do you think pottery is more functional or decorative? I think it can be both. Well, it is both. Um, some people are much more into the whole functional um, ways. For example, making tablewares, um, usually we call them potters. So people are much more into the whole ceramics making productions. So they make the same cups, they make the same bowl. And um, some people like to use things at their homes and also you know, fit into their lifestyles with things that they've made because it's a sense of achievement. I think for decorative part, um, for example, if you come from a painting background and then you really like ceramics and you want to blend the two together, then you can paint in ceramics, but obviously the canvas will be clay and the glazes will be different. I think that turning clay into a product is a really relaxing process. And at any point, if you're not happy about how the clay shape is forming, you can easily start all over again. So if you've been eyeing those beautiful handcrafted ceramics at the homeware store, why not try making them yourself? It's not that difficult. After the break, have a chat with jewelry guru Dennis Chan and kickstart a journey to wellness with a holistic health coach. Jewelry to me is very precious in the first place and something very personal, something valuable that you could pass on to your next generation. Hi, I'm Dennis, Dennis Chan, a jewelry designer. I like to bring the best. So a great opportunity to look after your mental and physical health at home. So today I am visiting a friend who's got some great tips for a healthy body and healthy mind. Hi, Mayuri. Hi, Darren. So for those of us who are uninitiated, what do you do? What is a wellness coach? So what I do is I work with people um, for different reasons. A lot of people do tend to come to me for weight loss. So that's one place that I definitely work with. Um, another is sleep. A lot of people seem to be having issues with sleeping or getting to sleep without the aid of medication. So I do work with some people on that as well, as well as digestive and hormonal problems. So you mentioned dieting. Mm -hmm. So how do you sort of tailor make a dieting plan for, for someone with different goals? Well, that is actually the most important thing is what is their goals? 
but alongside what is their goals, there are other things that I like to take a look at as well, which is, for example, the mindset. You know, what is the kind of mindset that a person brings to the first call? That in itself actually speaks volumes. See, for some people, it may be really easy for me to say, okay, Darren, for example, you seem like someone who's quite straight up and you'll, you'll sort of take what I tell you to do. Now, there are others that won't. There are those people who kind of come on the call, and this is also quite reflective about like how they are in life, right? They come on the call and they come on a call with a sort of like a scarcity mindset where there isn't enough of things around them. And now if I ask them to go ahead and start eliminating things, they will really struggle with that because they will immediately jump into, I'm being deprived. Mm. And when someone starts to operate around the field of food, right, with a deprivation mindset, the binge is equal and opposite to that. Right. So it's not sustainable. Right. right. So the mindset does play a big part as well. So for a lot of people in Hong Kong, city people, mm -hmm. their most common excuse is, I don't have time. Yep. I don't have time to be healthy. I don't have time to exercise. I don't mm. have time to go for good food. Yeah. What would you say to that? So I would say, wake up an hour earlier. I do this myself as well. So I wake up an hour before I kind of have to show up for the world. And I take that hour just for myself. I break that hour up into three sections, 20 minute sections each. And I spend 20 minutes, so my first 20 minutes, I uh, do some breath work, where I just sit and I do some breathing. It's called the Wim Hof Method. And then the second 20 minutes, I just do some yoga, um, just whatever my body feels like. Most of the time, I just do some Surya Namaskars and I just keep going for 20 minutes. The last 20 minutes is when I take a cup of coffee, sit back, and I do some journaling. What has been the difference between like doing this hour of getting ready and not doing it for you? Oh, an insane difference in my level of productivity. Like next level. Like the first few days, okay, I, to be honest, I struggled because I just wasn't used to getting up at that time and actually doing something productive with my life. But the minute I got used to it, um, it actually took my productivity to the next level. So other than dieting and physical activity, what other tips have you got for us um, to sustain a healthy lifestyle? So I like a pretty minimalistic approach around me, for right. example. This could be um, tricky for some people living in Hong Kong because normally the, the houses are much smaller here than they are in other countries, right? And of course, people like things. They like to possess things and people buy a lot more than they need. Now, where do you store it? But all around you. But why does it help? I feel it's a direct reflection of your state of mind. So you should try it, actually. T try it like an experiment, okay. okay? For a week, don't tidy your room up. Okay. Just leave things lying around everywhere. And just track what is your productivity at work? How clear are your thoughts? How much peace of mind do you have? Okay? And then do the opposite the next week. And right. I guarantee you, you will see a difference. Today, I got some great advice from my Yuri. And the one piece that really sticks out is to develop a good eating habit. You need to find one that works for you and one that you can maintain for the long term because after all, you are what you eat. And as for me personally, I think in the future, I'm gonna add a little bit of a breathing exercise into my morning routine so that I can feel calm and in hurry and ready to start my day. That's all the time we have for this week's episode. If you want to find out more about what we've introduced, remember to log on to our website. In the coming weeks, indulge in the sweet life with us, take pleasure in gourmet food from around the world, explore fun and effective ways to stay healthy and look gorgeous, keep up with the latest trend in every aspect of life, and stay connected with inspiring people from different backgrounds. Be sure to tune in again next time!